So this is part two of the pre-calculus review. We're going to start here uh, on the section involving functions, and we'll start with uh, uh, functional notation uh, and literacy. So what we mean by functional notation is you can see down here the sort of f and g, so f of 2 and g of negative 2, so we're trying to work with that. And the literacy part is trying to understand statements like this. What does this mean? So for what x values, if f of x is equal to g of x, or find the solutions to the equation um, f of x equal to negative 1. So this is what we kind of mean by uh, functional literacy. Uh, the idea is basically, is it input stuff or is it uh, output stuff? But let's come up to the sort of functional notation part where we want to try to find f of 2. So here's f of 2. And it's going to be equal to what? Well, the input value here is 2. So on our graph, we go over to 2. And we're going to look up. Now remember, there's two graphs here. There's the graph F, which is in red, and the graph G, which is in blue. Uh, fortunately, when you plug in 2, you actually get the same value out for both of them. So it's right up here. And so the output is also 2. So F of 2 is equal to 2. Whereas for g of negative 2, let's look at that. So we go over here, negative 1, negative 2. So we can write, you know, this over negative 1, over negative 2. Right, so remember, this is input stuff because it's on the inside. And then the output, you look up, and it goes right here, and it has height 1. And again, I guess it doesn't matter which one you take, the blue or the red. Of course, we want the blue because it's g. Uh, but you get the same output, so this is equal to 1. And now, for the next problem, what we want to do is we want to find the x values for which f of x is equal to uh, g of x. So they have the same uh, exact uh, outputs. And so you'll see here they have the same exact outputs right here. And right there, it's where they cross. It's where they intersect. And so we already know those two x values. We already found them. The x is equal to negative 2, or I should say we already used them up here. So x equals negative 2 and x equals 2. So we can separate it by a comma if you want, or you can say x equals negative 2 and x equals uh, 2. So those are the two x values where the outputs, so these are outputs, is the output is equal to output for g. So the output of f is equal to output of g. Uh, in part c, we want to find solutions to the equation f of x is equal to uh, negative 1. And so on this one, right, just like up here, it's not input stuff. It's actually output stuff. It's on the outside. So we want to find out when the output is negative 1. So negative 1 output is right here. You go down 1. And we're looking for when f, not g, but f is equal to negative 1. So f is this red piece here. And so when is it negative 1? Well, it's negative 1 over here. And it has height negative 1 right here. And so you look back up. And so this is input of negative 3. And over here, this is input of, right, you have 1, 2, 3, and 4. Four. So this is for find the solutions to this equation. So you have two answers for this one. x equal to negative 3. You can see that when you plug in negative 3, you do get out negative 1. And x equal to positive 4. So if you want, you should put a comma and a 4 is fine. So x equal negative 3 uh, and 4. They both give you out negative 1 when you plug it in uh, for f. And let's look at the next one here, 14. Now this is slightly different. This is a function of two variables. So the, the example above, this is a function of one variable. f is a function of x and g is a function of x. Now we have a new function f and it's a function of x and y. And we want to find f of 5 comma 2. So f of 5 comma 2 is equal to, so wherever I see an x, I'm going to put a 5. And wherever I see a y, I'm going to put a 2. So I have 1 plus. 3 times 5 times 2 minus 5 times 5 squared. And so what is that equal to? That's equal to 1 plus, and then 3 times 5 is 15, times 2 is 30, so plus 30. And then minus 5 squared is 25, and times 5 is 125. And so basically, I'm going to count down 30. So I go down 25 and get to 100, down 5 more to 95. All right, so I'm at negative 95. And then I go down one more, which gives me negative 94. So I just count down 30 units and count down one more unit, and I get negative uh, 94. 
as my answer there. So that's sort of working with functional notation, and then the literacy part is trying to figure out input output uh, stuff, and working with the graph uh, in this situation. Uh, over here, on the next problem, 15, uh, we want to work with the domain range and then the change, how a function changes. So this should say use, not us, so use the graph, uh, use the given graph of f to find the following. All right, so we want to find the domain and the range. So for the domain, the domain, remember, are input uh, values, the things you can plug into the function. So when you look at this graph here, you see the graph is good, 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 but then it continues to go all the way up. So right here, you're good here, this is your input values, you're good, you're good, you're good, but when you get to negative 4, you have to stop because you can't plug negative 4 into your function because you see it's a vertical asymptote, uh, so it's undefined there. But then you can pick up after negative 4. So notice I'm drawing these parentheses here around uh, negative 4. You're good. All these are good input values. If you look above it, you see a graph, or below it, you see a graph. So good, 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 until you get to negative 1 because you see how the graph continues to go down. But there is no value when you plug in negative 1. We pick it up on the other side of negative one. You're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. Now here you may think there's an issue because there's a hole, uh, but it's actually the hole is closed right here. So there's a well-defined value. When you plug in zero, you actually get out zero. So you're good, you're good, you're good. Oh, you're always good for the remainder of the x values. So all the way out to the right, and of course you can go all the way out to the left. So when I write down the domain D, what I'm going to do is I say all the way to the left, so negative infinity, comma, and then I stop here at negative 4, so negative 4. And then union, I pick up right after negative 4, so left parenthesis. So it's not including negative 4, but you pick up right after it. And then we went all the way to negative 1, so comma to negative 1, in parenthesis. And then union, negative 1, comma, all the way out to the right. So we write positive infinity, which means all the way out to the right. And this is a parenthesis here. So notice how we used uh, the parentheses, which mean do not include the point, but go all the way up to uh, it. So that's the domain. Uh, for the range, for the range, we'll use the letter R. And instead of looking at the inputs, you look at the outputs. So right here, we start down here, and you see, oh, there's a graph to the left or the right. So there's a graph to the left, so you're good. Uh, good, good, good. You keep going up, you keep going up. You're good, you're good. There's always a graph to the left or the right. Even when you pass this point, I know there's a hole here, but if you look to the left, there is a graph, so you can go through there. That's good, that's good. So it looks like everything can go all the way up and versus all the way down. So everything is in my range. So this is from negative infinity to positive uh, infinity. All right, so that's for domain and range. You simply look at the inputs for the domain, you look at the outputs for the range uh, on the graph. For increasing and decreasing, Let's clear this. Let's erase this so we can then look or draw on it for increasing and decreasing. It's pretty easy. So to figure out increasing, uh, we're going to use green because like green is good and increasing is good, whereas decreasing is bad, so we'll use red. So you always read a graph from left to right, and you can see here that it's increasing, it's increasing, it continues to go up, 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 all the way up, so that's all increasing stuff. And then it decreases, it decreases, it decreases, it decreases, decreases. decreases. You may argue that it kind of levels out here, so we'll talk about that in a minute. And then you pick it up over here, it decreases, it decreases, it decreases. Then you come down here, and then it starts to increase. So it increases, it increases, but then it decreases again and again down here. So these are the green spots where it's increasing, and you can look at the input values underneath it. So these are where it's increasing. And then starting at 0, and going to 1. So let's say it's increasing from, oh, I shouldn't say starting here, it goes all the way out, right? So all the way out, so from negative infinity to negative four, it's increasing. Union, it's also increasing on this little interval from zero to one, right? So I'm just writing down these input values, where if you look at the function, the graph above it, it's increasing. And then of course it's decreasing everywhere else, but let's, let's draw this, so where is it decreasing? So it continues to decrease, it goes down, it goes down, 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 down. Now, one might argue that something funny happens right here because it kind of levels off. Um, so we might argue that there's sort of a leveling off point right here. So let me just kind of put a little circle around that. And then, of course, it continues to 
decrease, 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 decrease. You pick it up on the other side, it's decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. You pick it up over here, but it's increasing, but then right here it starts to decrease, and it continues to decrease all the way down. It continues all the way out. So one might say that it's decreasing from here up to negative three, and then from negative three to one. All right, so one might say this, that it is decreasing from negative four uh, to negative three. And then union uh, from negative three to negative one. Now some would argue that you should include negative three, but to me it kind of looks like it's leveling off. So if I think it's leveling off here, it's kind of like a flat point where it levels off, where it's really not increasing nor decreasing at that point, something different is going on there. I'll take that point out. Uh, now, if you don't take it out, uh, is, is it necessarily wrong? Well, it really depends on what sort of definition you're using for uh, for decreasing. So I typically don't count off uh, too much for it. So if you would have put negative four uh, to negative one, I probably would have still uh, giving you the the points for it, but if you split it up like you're supposed to, then sometimes if it's on an exam, I'll actually give you a bonus point uh, for realizing that. All right, so let's get back to the the problem. So where is it decreasing? So you have that to that, then you pick it up on the other side of negative one uh, to zero. So union negative one to zero continues to decrease. Union, then you pick it up over here at one, and then all the way out to the right, it is decreasing. So from uh, one comma infinity. So that's where it's uh, decreasing. And again, if you change this right here, and write negative four to negative one, that's fine, I won't take off for it. But if you actually split up the interval, which which is a little bit better because again, something strange is happening here, I'll actually typically give you a uh, bonus point. Okay, so uh, let's look for uh, minimums and uh, maximums. Now, Local minimums and local maximums, these are very easy ideas. Local minimums are bas basically locally low values, and local maximums are uh, high values. And typically, if you color code this, it's where you change color. Now, you notice you go from green to red here, but there is no local maximum because the point's undefined. Uh, this is all red, this is red. Now, here you change from red uh, to green, so there's probably something going on here. Now, that's not an obvious one. This is an obvious one right here. Right, so there's definitely a local maximum at f of, you plug in one and you get out one. That's so when you plug in one, you get out height one. Uh, that's definitely a local uh, maximum. Um, and then that, that's it for maximums, but there is a local minimum. Now, I don't always take off if you don't see this one because it's kind of tricky. Uh, but if you look right here, at this point right here, notice how it switched from red to green. This there's a good argument for saying that this is a local uh, minimum because locally, if you go to the uh, right, it's the lowest point. And even if you go to the left, it's the lowest point. So there's a local minimum at f of zero equal to zero. And you can actually find these by just looking for the change in color if you color code them. Or you know the local minimum is the locally the lowest point, local maximum is locally the uh, highest point. Uh, and remember, it's local, so it's not global. You're just looking in the in the in the region. So yeah, you know, even though the points over here are higher locally, this is the highest one. Uh, even though the points over here are lower locally, this is the lowest uh, one. All right. So now let's do concave up and uh, concave down. Let me erase what we drew on here. All right. So for concave up and concave down, remember concave up is a smile and concave down is a frown. So I'm going to do green with smiles, concave up. So this is definitely part of a smile. This is all concave up stuff here. And then this is, on the other side of it, is definitely part of a, if you look at this, it's part of a smile. I mean, you can put, you know, faces on there, right? So that's part of a smile. So this is all smiling at me until I get right about here. And then it switches to concave down. All right, so I'm going to switch to red. We'll do this all in one go through. So then it switches to red, so it's concave down, it's part of a frown. And then it goes back to concave up. Right here, that's part of a smile. You can see how it's smiling, kind of. That's part of a smile. Oh, and that's definitely part of a frown, so because it's concave, so it's concave down, so let's use red. So this is all part of a, a frown here, part of a frown. But then, you see it does turn back into a smile, so right about here, you have to kind of guess, so 
you make the sort of the best guess you can. Uh, so it turns back into a smile right here. So that's smiling at me. And so concave up from here to here. You stop at negative 4 because it's undefined there. So concave up from negative infinity from negative infinity to negative 4. Union make my union not a U, but it looks kind of like a U, but it's like this, from union, and then you pick it up right after negative 4, and you head over to negative 3, so all those input values, if you look at the graph above, it's concave up, so negative 4 to negative 3, union, and then over here you pick it up at negative 1 and head over to 0, so negative 1 to 0, union, you pick it up at 2 and head all the way out. So then this is then a 2 to infinity. So that's where it's concave up. And then everywhere else it's going to be concave down. So it's concave down from negative 3 to negative 1. So concave down from negative 3 to negative 1. Union, and then you pick it back up at 0 and go out to 2. So 0 to 2. So on uh, these two intervals, if you look at the graph above or below the x-axis, you'll see it's concave down. And then the final thing we want to do are inflection points. And for the inflection points, what's nice about this is it's just kind of like finding local mins and local maximums if you colored it. It's just where you change color. So for inflection points where you change concavity. So if you colored it, it's just where you change color. So here you can see you went from uh, green to red. Here you go from green to red, so there should be an inflection point there, and then red to green uh, right there. Now I don't always count this one if you don't see it as, you know, uh, if you don't see it I don't usually count it off, but these two are definitely classical inflection points where you're changing concavity. So they're points, so you have input, output, so the first one's negative 3 is the input, and the output is 0, and then this one right here is you plug in 2 and you get out 0, so you definitely need these two, and then oftentimes, if you don't see this one, it's okay, I don't take off, but sometimes uh, I'll often give you a bonus point for it, because it does change concavity. The definition is where the function, uh, the point where the function changes concavity. So here it's concave up, here it's concave down, so you know, you could, you could argue that this point right here, 0 comma 0, is a, an inflection point, because it did change uh, concavity. And so this is working with the domain and range, uh, increasing, decreasing, local mins, local maxes, concave up and concave down, and inflection points uh, with a graph. We'll eventually do this with calculus because we won't have a graph. What we'll have is just a formula to work with, and we'll use rules uh, and ideas from calculus to determine this just given the uh, formula. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about the algebra of functions and inverses. So the algebra and functions, remember, it involves adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and composing. Now, the first four operations you guys are pretty good with is the composition that we struggle with a little bit. So I wanted to do one of these problems on this uh, pre-calculus review. So we want to find f composed with g of x. Now, the idea of composition is you put a function inside of a function. And the reason why it's kind of difficult is it's something new. We typically work with numbers uh, before this class a lot, and, and, and working with numbers, uh, you can't really put a number inside of a number, so this is sort of a different idea. Um, it's an important idea, and there are always, when we're working with functions, there's functions uh, and inside functions. But let's, um, the, you know, examples of this are like I insurance or, or car loans or something like that. You know, there's there's always a formula for, uh, let's say, a car loan when you go and buy a car, but uh, my, my monthly payment will be different than your monthly payment, even if we're going to buy the exactly the same car for exactly the same price, because uh, inside that car loan formula is an interest rate uh, formula, and the interest rate depends upon uh, different things like, you know, how old you are, what's your credit score, um, and things like things like that, you know, mostly your credit score, I, I would guess. Uh, but then it returns a rate for you, and so that determines your monthly payment. Um, even if we're buying the same car, my monthly payment may be higher or lower uh, than yours. So it's like a function inside of a function. So here we have a, basically a composition, which is a function inside of a function. So what does this mean? This means take f of g of x. So I like to write the g of x kind of small, and the f 
of it really big. So it's really clear that G is inside here. So then this is telling me what to do. So once I decipher what this means, and the, it's easy to remember because the order stays the same, uh, then I just do what it says. So what's G of X? I just write down G of X inside there. So it's F of 2X plus 4. So I just write down 2x plus 4 because that's what g of x is equal to. And then I'm going to do f of 2x plus 4. Now, here's where it's a little bit tricky. So you're going to have to read what f is. Now, f uses this x. We have to remember it uses x because it's just a symbol we're familiar with. All right, remember, a function is really just a rule. So what's the rule for f? The rule for f is whatever is here, you're going to square it and take away 16. All right, so let me say this again. You're going to, you know, whatever it is, you're going to square it and take away 16. So now if this is your it, you're going to square it and take away 16. So when you do that, say it, you're going to square it, right? not square x, but square it. So this is it squared, and then take away, so it means minus 16. And so when you're doing stuff like this, you kind of have to read uh, what the function is. And don't think about too hard about the x, because really this x and this x aren't the same x. Right? x is sort of like just a placeholder, like a thing that's telling you what the rule is. Uh, then we're going to square this out. So if you multiply 2x plus 4 times 2x plus 4, you're going to get 4x squared. You're going to get 2 times 8x, so you're going to get plus 16x. And then plus 16 on the end, right, with a minus 16 here. So remember, 2x plus 4 quantity squared is really 2x plus 4 times... 2x plus 4. Right, and then you're going to foil this out, and that's going to give you this 4x squared plus, 8, plus 16x plus 16. So the 16s are going to cancel, and you're going to be left with just 4x squared plus 16x. Right, so this is something that uh, is often difficult for students um, to do in the beginning, but once you get the hang of it, it's really sort of a reading operation, and there, there's some algebra involved too, but, but it's a reading operation, and once you understand what a function is telling you to do, then you simply do it. Uh, but it does take a little bit of work uh, to get there. All right, so number 17 is on inverses. Uh, so this is mostly an exercise to make sure that you actually understand what an inverse is. So the idea of an inverse of a function is if you have a function that goes from input to output, if there's an inverse, that means you go from output back to the input. So if you want to make a table uh, of a function that does not have an inverse, what you need is you have to have two output values that are the same that go back to two different input values. So uh, as an example, let's just do one, two, three for our input values. And then over here, let's make this output value 6, and then let's make this output value 7. Now, this is still a function, and it has an inverse right now. To make it not have an inverse, we need to make this either 6 or 7. So let's make it 6. If you make this 6, now it no longer has an inverse, because if you want to go from output to input, you say the output is 6, you could go back to 1, or you could go back to 3. Right? So this is an example of a table that does not have uh, an inverse. Now over here it says draw a graph of a function that does not have an inverse. Right, so this one, you want the same idea. You want to have two output values that are the same that go back to two different input values. And so the easiest example is probably something like this, or just a parabola. And you can see that certainly there are, for the parabola, you could just use the number 4, and just to illustrate this. So here's the height 4 over here, and here's the height 4 over here. And these are supposed to go back to the same, or two different input values, so like negative 2 and positive 2. And so it certainly won't have an inverse, because if you give me output of 4, which one do I go back to? Do I go back to 2, or do I go back to negative 2? I, I don't know which one I, I need to go back to. That, that's why it does not have a well-defined inverse, right? so not uh, have an inverse. And then write down a formula function that does not have an inverse. Well. I just said the parabola here, so let's just write down a formula for the parabola, which is x uh, squared. Right, so these are all examples uh, of different ways to represent functions that a function that does not have an uh, inverse. Uh, in general, if a function is going to have an inverse, we say it needs to be one to one. Right, what that means is that for each input, yes, you have an output, but that output is unique. Right, so there are no other um, 
there are no other inputs leading to that one output. There's just a single input. Uh, let's look down here at this uh, elementary function section. So this is really important, uh, especially in, in calculus, because you, you, you realize here uh, that in calculus, there are just basically four functions. Uh, there is a power function, there's an exponential function, a logarithmic function, and then trigonometric, and of course, <laughs> I don't need to usher you in here, functions. That, that's it. And all the other functions that we typically work with uh, are built out of these basic types of functions by using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and composition. Once you realize this, uh, it, it makes calculus sort of a little bit easier to understand uh, in the sense of like what we're doing and when we learn how to take uh, derivatives. So what we want to do is we want to look at this function, which is made out of a lot of these, the power functions, exponential log, and trig. In fact, I included a volume here, and we want to pull it apart. We want to pull it apart in a way that we rewrite this as in terms of you know basic power functions, basic elementary, basic log, and basic trig. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to make up some functions here. We'll have the function a of x, and we'll have the function b of x. I'm going to kind of pull it apart, and we'll just keep on going. So I kind of just go from left to right, inside out. It kind of takes a little while, but here I have x squared. Now that's a power function, so I can write a of x as x squared. That's a legitimate uh, thing to do. And then I have the tan function, so I'll write b of x as the tan function. So tan of x. And then c of x is going to be equal to, you see on top here I have the e function, so I'm going to write e to the x. And then down here I have my d of x now. And then so in the e I have an x times root x. Now that's actually a power function. x times root x is the same as x times x to the 1 half. And remember here, that's really x to the 1, so you can add exponents, so you really have x to the 3 halves. Right? 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. And so that's going to be my d of x. And then you're going to divide by, now here you have a, this is really a power function, so it's really the constant function of 1. I'm going to skip e of x and f of x, I'm going to write g of x. I skip e of x because it looks like the number e, and f of x because I called this f of x. And I'll e that equal to 1, and then finally I'll say h of x is equal to, so you have plus ln of x. So these are all these sort of basic elementary, examples of basic elementary functions, you know, a power function, a trig function, an exponential function, another power function, another power function, a logarithmic function. And now I'm going to put them back together to create f of x. So f of x is equal to, and you can do this in a number of ways. If you don't want to write the f of x notation, that's fine. So you can just write uh, a, and then I'm going to write a times, so I'm going to put a little star instead of the x because it looks like an x. So times the tan function, so times b. And it's b of, so there's a composition here. So b composed, well composed with what? Well it's composed with this thing inside. So composed with, I'm going to put a big parenthesis here. So composed with, and then on top you have this e to the, so you have really c of x, so that's e to the, so c. composed with, because S is inside, so composed with D, so C of D, and then divided by, because this is divided by, and then you have 1 plus, so that's really, the 1 is G, so you have G plus, and then the ln of X, which is the H, in parentheses, and you may even want to put parentheses around this whole thing, because it's a times this whole thing. Okay, so that's how I would write it uh, like this if I, I wanted to. There are other ways to write it, but you know, as as long as you're not too far off, you'll be just fine. The, the point of this problem is just to see how every function that you, you've ever seen can basically be decomposed into these basic elementary functions by using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and, and composition because uh, we'll use this uh, throughout the semester, um, when we, especially when we learn how to take uh, derivatives. Okay, what's next? Um, so we have, oh, the modeling section. Okay, so we're in this with the modeling, uh, which is one of the harder things to do because you kind of have to use a picture to come up with a, a formula. Fortunately, all the pictures are given to us in these problems. Uh, one of the harder parts to do, the, one of the harder things to do is actually make the pictures, label them in a, uh, it, 
in a way that you can actually come up uh, with a formula. But let's let's do this, okay? So uh, here we have a box with an open top. It is constructed from a rectangular piece of paper with a width of 11. So this is actually equal to 11 inches and a length of 16 inches. So that's actually 16 inches. Uh, by cutting out equal squares uh, of side x in each corner and then folding up the side. So here you're cutting out the squares of length x. Express the volume of the box as a function of uh, x. So basically you want to find a formula for the volume. This is what we're looking for and, and we want to find it in terms of x, right? Uh, but that's that's the idea. Now oftentimes students struggle a lot with this problem. And the reason they struggle a lot with this problem is, is because they're looking at the two-dimensional figure when they should be really looking at the box, which isn't a two-dimensional figure, it's a three-dimensional figure. So what you need to do is come down here and we just need to draw what the box would look like. So you know you fold up these sides and so you get sort of this long side here. All right, then it goes back. I'm just drawing a, a sort of box here the best that I, uh, I can. So there's my box. And you can use colors. It's always nice to use colors and kind of see where the sides come from. So like, you know, um, this bottom side right here, in some sense, so let's not use green, let's use let's use blue. So this bottom side right here, right, corresponds to the same length as this side right here. And I actually know this length. If this whole length is 16, then this blue length is not quite 16, it's 16 minus 2x. Mm -hmm. And then, so we can label this side if you want, 16 minus 2x. And we can keep on doing this. And so here I have another side, this side right here, which corresponds to this length right there. And that, the whole length is 11. So this whole length from here all the way down here is 11. So it's not quite 11, but it's 11 minus 2x. So this red length is 11 minus 2x. And then of course you have one more. And we can make it purple if you like. So here we have this purple height. And the purple height just corresponds to this length right here on the two-dimensional picture. And obviously it's labeled x. And so then when we go to find the formula for the volume, right, so I go to find my sort of equation here. I, this is my picture. And then I find my equation, E or my formula basically. I want to find a formula for V. Now volume is length times width times height. And you can see the length is 16 minus 2x. And then the width of my box is 11 minus 2x. And the height is just x. And so there's a formula for the volume in terms of x. If you want to multiply it out, you can. Or you can just leave it like this, because it just says express the volume of the box as a function of x, which I just did. And so this is my answer right here. So that's a geometric problem using uh, volume. If you look down here on number 20 and 21, uh, these are problems that are use certain types of, uh, of theorems. Uh, in number 20, we're going to use similar triangles, where in 21, we're going to use Pythagorean theorem. So they're, in some sense, a little bit harder, but not, not much, uh, if you think about them in the right way. So in number 20, says, Thales of Miletus, uh, the great philosopher, was able to determine the heights of the great pyramids by using a, uh, the shadow of a rod. Find the height of this pyramid by using the diagram given. So the idea is, if you want to figure out the height of an object, you don't always have to measure it directly, especially if you can't measure it directly. Uh, if you can't do it, you have to use uh, some other uh, technique. And so in this case, we're going to use the shadow of this five-foot rod. So Thales of uh, Miletus looks at this five-foot rod and notices there's an eight-foot shadow. Uh, he doesn't know the height of the pyramid, but he can measure the distance uh, the rod is away uh, from the pyramid by simply walking it off. And so what you get here is you get actually two triangles. You have a little triangle right here. And then you have the great big triangle that uh, surrounds it. All right, so you have this great big triangle right here. And there's similar triangles. And remember, similar triangles just means just means that the, the triangles have all, have all the angles are, are are the same. And so when you when you look at this, you're like, okay, well, what do I, what do I know? I know that this side 
divided by that side, so 5 eighths. It's just sort of like coming up with my equation, right? The picture was given to me. 5 eighths is equal to, what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to this side, h, divided by this side, which is not quite 272, so it's 272 plus 8, which is 280. And then I can solve this for h, so now I can solve this equation, this sort of formula. So h is going to be equal to uh, 280 times uh, 5 eighths. And I can simplify this relatively quickly because these are both even. Uh, so, you know, uh, let's see, this is 140 times 5 divided by 4, which is equal to still even. So 70 times 5 divided by 2 which is equal to 35 times 5, which is equal to, well, 30 times uh, 5 is, what, 150, and then 25, so it's 175 feet. I think we're in feet, yep, so 175 feet. That's the height uh, of the uh, pyramid. Let's look at the last problem, number 21. Now, number 21 is a great problem because you can actually use the room that you're in because most rooms are uh, sort of like a rec are rectangular. Um, so there are eight corners uh, in a rectangular room. And you can see the eight corners, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and we want to find a formula for the distance from the lower left corner up to the lower right corner. So let's draw that in our picture. So you can kind of draw this up there. Um, and we want to find this in terms of L, W, and H. So I gave you the picture, I gave you L, W, and H, and we want to find this distance from here to here. Now this is an exercise in the Pythagorean theorem, and when you're working with the Pythagorean theorem, remember you have to work with right triangles, because A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. The problem with applying the Pythagorean theorem here is that first the triangle is not obvious, so you have to look a little bit, and you look at that blue line, and you ask yourself the question is, do you see a right triangle involving that blue line? And, and if you look at it, you might be like, well, here's something. But it's not quite the, a right triangle, but it looks like part of it. But it, if you think a little bit outside of the box, or in some sense inside of the box, you'll see there's a straight line from there to there, and then you get a right triangle. So um, let's call this big D. That's what we're looking for. And so this is my picture. And then this is little d, let's call it. And so now I know for an equation, I know big D squared, because that's like my C. So C squared is equal to little d squared plus h squared. So little d squared plus h squared. That's Pythagorean theorem. Now this is not what I want. What I want is in terms of L, W, and H. Right now I have big D in terms of little d and little h. But if you look closely, you'll see little d is also part of a right triangle right here. There's a right triangle. That's a right angle. And so there's a right triangle right here. And so then I also know that little d squared, that's the hypotenuse of my right triangle, is equal to L squared plus W squared. And so now I can basically solve, you know, I just plug in here. And so I get big D squared equal to L squared plus W squared plus H squared. And so I'm basically done. If you want to complete this, you know, all the way, what you would do is take the square root of both sides. So you have D on the left. And then remember, the square root does not go through addition, so it's going to stay on the right. So you just have L squared plus W squared plus H squared. And that's a formula. Uh, for the distance of those uh, two corners, between those two corners.